So welcome everyone to the Irish American Heritage Museum. We're back um, with a virtual event again uh, because our speaker is coming to us at the witching hour. Thank you so much, John Joe, for staying up late. Uh, John Joe McGinley is a journalist, author and advocate from um, near Guido or in Donegal. And so he's um, going to have he, he's going to talk to us tonight about our topic, which is Irish wise guys and kind of the evolution of the gangs of New York who were, we'll say, semi-criminal right up through the modern sort of era of prohibition and how that sharpened everything and, and really did make them, by definition, criminals. Uh, so John Joe is a very busy man. He's a father of four children. He is a writer for Ireland's Own and the Irish Echo, among others. He runs a fantastic podcast called Irish Wise Guys. Dot IE. Um, he's writing his third book. We have copies of the book that he's kind of working on or that he's talking about tonight that will be coming into the museum gift shop for those of you who are local. Um, but he's also an advocate for autism. Uh, he runs a, a blog and website called Autism and Dad. So he does a lot of work on that. And he's a part time tour guide at the local distillery in Donegal. So if you're ever over in Donegal, you should check out the whiskey. I'm sure it's beautiful. Although maybe not as nice as the dingle, I have to always plug Kerry. <laughs> so yeah, welcome, well. John Joe, and thank you so much for coming tonight. Oh, well, thank you very so much for having me on. And hello to everybody. And uh, hello from uh, the darkest Skidor, Donegal. <laughs> yeah, well, because it is midnight there. You're very good to stay up yeah, late. It is midnight. <laughs> I can't see the sea, but I can hear it. <laughs> yeah, oh, God, yeah. I, I saw your temperature. It's cold there tonight, too. Oh, it's, we've, got, we've got a wee storm brewing. But, uh, yeah, yeah, summer's yeah, gone. <laughs> nothing new in Donegal. But it's, You're right, exactly. It's always beautiful here. Well, that's true. That That is good. Even the wild Atlantic, sure, what's not to like. So will you, you can share your screen now, if you like, and I've highlighted you as the speaker. Right, Tiho. My name is John Drew McGinley. I am the author of Irish Wise Guys and the Irish in Power. And tonight I would like to talk to you about some of the elements that are in my book, The Irish Wise Guys. This is a no holds barred account of 17 of the most notorious Irish American gangsters, men like Whitey Bulger, Vincent Mad Dog Call, George Machine Gun Kelly, and Only the Killer Madam. Now, in different circumstances, these men could have been captains of industry, politicians, or union leaders. Instead, they chose a path of crime that would make them into some of the most wanted men in America. Uh, whilst the book tells the story of about 17 uh, Irish American gangsters, what I want to do tonight is look at three uh, periods. The first is uh, the initial formation of the Irish gangs, looking at a, a man called John Morrissey. Then I want to look at how the Irish gangs evolved into a period called the White Hand Gang, which was eventually brought to an end by a certain Al Capone. And then I want to talk about a man called Oni the Killer Madam, the Irish American gangster who was originally born in Leeds, but his family was from Mayo, a man who actually either knew, uh, was a friend, the enemy, or was involved with virtually everybody. Right. Yeah, you were saying that, you know, they had this great talent, thank you, and intelligence, and they would could have been successful in other walks of life had they so chosen. Right. Okay, right. we're well, back. So, <laughs> so I do apologise, folks. That's what happens when you live right by the sea in the, the northwest Donegal. I have no idea what happened there with the technology. But again, apologies. So going back to what I was saying, these men could have been uh, anything they wanted in life but they chose a path of crime. They, there's a few things that are common with them. They uh, all came from uh, broken homes. They had extreme poverty, and that's not to defend them in any way, but they also had uh, great intelligence, and they turned that intelligence towards crime. So what I'd like to try and do is just take a little few snippets from the book. The first one I'd like to try and do is talk about a man called John Morrissey, who was not only a, a bare knuckle boxing champion of the world, not once, but twice, a, a, a brothel keeper, a criminal, a gang leader, a brawler, but he ended up as a US congressman. And he was instrumental in the establishment of the Irish gangs in New York. Then I want to look at the White Hand Gang, who were the evolution of the gangs that had evolved around the war front of New York, and who were brought down by a certain uh, Al Capone. 
And then finally, I want to talk about Oni the Killer Madam, a man who was either the friend, enemy, or associate of anyone who was anyone in Irish American, Italian American, and just plain old American crime in the 20s and 30s. So hopefully you'll enjoy it and I'm happy to take any questions. You know, when you talk about uh, crime, it's, it's glamorized by certain movies such as uh, The Goodfellas, which just actually had its, its anniversary there the last couple of days. And again, whilst it focuses on the Italian mafia, it did have two Irish American uh, people there. Jimmy the Gent Burke was one of the, the most famous. But what I'd like to try and do is talk about how the Irish who flooded in to New York and spent a lot of the time in Hell's Kitchen. Now, the first time that Hell's Kitchen was mentioned was in print, actually uh, on September the 22nd, anniversary of only a few days ago. A New York Times reporter covering a story on a particularly gruesome multiple murder referred to an infamous tenement at 39th Street and 10th Avenue as being in Hell's Kitchen and that the area was probably the lowest and filthiest in the city. Now, another story goes, and one I actually prefer, that a veteran New York policeman was sagely watching a riot between rival gangs on the same West 39th Street near 10th Avenue with a young partner. The rookie, appalled by the carnage, turned and said to him, this place is hell itself. The cop, who went by the name of Dutch Fred, calmly responded, hell's a mild climate. This is hell's kitchen. It was into this area that men like John Morrissey sprang up as leaders. You know, when he became an American congressman, John Morrissey once told the US House of Representatives during a rather heated debate, I've been a war rat, chicken thief, prize fighter, gambler, a member of Congress. And if any gentleman on the other side wants his constitution amended, just let him step into the rotunda with me. And that's no idle threat because John Morrissey, who rose from humble beginnings to the top of New York society and American politics, has used his fists and intellect in equal manner. He became the bare knuckle boxing champion of the world, not once, but twice. And he was infamously one of the organizers and the leaders of what Hollywood has uh, sagely defined as the dead rabbits, which were, in fact was more a confederation of Irish American gangs in Hell's Kitchen that were brought together by politics. Because Morrissey's physique and prowess in brutal street fights as part of the gang convinced them to pursue uh, a more less strenuous career. You know, his first fight was in uh, a certain Captain Isaiah Rinder's saloon at 28 Park Row. You know, Captain Rinder worked for the Tammany Hall organization. His job, which was to arrange general mayhem and ballot box stuffing to ensure victory for the right candidate that was backed by Tammany Hall. And he was always on the lookout for young men with physique and intelligence. And when he saw John Morrissey brawling with not one, not two, but six other men, he decided that was the man that should be working for Tammany Hall. And John Morrissey not only became a gang leader, but a political fixer for Tammany Hall. And it was in this role that he came across this man, Bill the Butcher. Because whilst the initial Irish immigrants had been Protestant and amalgamated quite easily into American society. The influx after Anne Got Moore, the Great Hunger, uh, with so many Irish Catholic immigrants coming to New York, it spurred the, the rise of anti-Irish political parties. And one of those was the Know Nothing organization. And they obtained their nickname in a strange way because they had a standard reply any question regarding the rules and their attacks on Irish immigrants, which was, I know nothing about that, hence the know nothing. But their central tenet was they wanted to stem the rise of Roman Catholic Irish immigration into America. And when Morrissey gained control of the amalgamation of the Irish gangs that would be uniquely called the Dead Rabbits, he developed an intense rivalry with William Poole, Bill the Butcher, who 
whose nickname Bill the Butcher was well deserved. You know, whilst he was famously portrayed by Daniel Day Lewis in the gangs of New York, the fight between him and Morrissey was not really in the film. And it was an important part of the evolution of not only Irish American politics in New York, but the gang structure. Because the two gangs, the Know Nothing Gang and the gang led by Morrissey, became the enforcers for the battling political parties. Tammany Hall, which embraced the Irish Catholic immigration, and the Know Nothings, which wanted to end the and oppose Irish Catholic immigration into New York. You know, Morrissey and Poole were both intelligent men, but they were also strong boxers. And they actually fought a, a bare knuckle boxing bout. And whilst Morrissey, who had been a world champion not once but twice, Poole actually defeated him. But Morrissey and his gang got the revenge when they actually arranged for the murder of Poole. Now, Morrissey uh, was initially arrested for that, but was never convicted. But the fact was that the Irish in New York realised that he was on their side for removing one of the most hated figures. And it was such that he then established a groundwork of support to allow him to move into politics. And he then became a US congressman. But through that, he made so much money that he then built a state-of-the-art casino and a clubhouse and a race course in Saratoga Springs, which was opened in 1863. He was now a wealthy man and he was reinventing himself. And it shows the evolution that would happen in years to come of the Irish gang members. They started off in poverty, they used their, their skill, their intelligence, and sometimes their brutality to rise forward. And he used that. And he was, as a successful uh, man, and he entered the politics, he then decided to try and clean up the very politics that he helped establish. And he became a rival candidate to the Tammany Hall organization. And in fact, he was instrumental in 1877 of actually bringing down Boss Tweed, who was the major owner and the backer of Tammany Hall. And he did so much in his short life. He organized the Irish into the gangs. He helped them establish in the political system. He then became part of the political system himself. He used the wealth he established in the political system to basically clean up his past reputation and become what if you remember The Godfather, as Michael Corleone had always desired to become respectable. But sadly, he died so young. He contracted pneumonia and died in 1878 at the age of 47. But if a man who was born in Temple Moore and who used his wits and his fists to rise from poverty to become a US congressman, 20,000 mourners lined the streets to pay their last respects. And the New York State Senate closed for the day and attended his funeral. And he was buried in St. Peter's Cemetery, just out of his birthplace of Troy. But what John Morrissey did was he ensured that the disparate number of all the gangs that set up in Hell's Kitchen along the war fronts started to organize and rather become just pickpockets and brothel keepers, they started to organize themselves along the lines to take advantage of all the economic opportunities that crime would offer for them in the future. Uh, and Jandro, as they sorry, did that, you, will you just show them the picture of Morrissey? Because we're on pool there. Oh, sorry. I'll go back. Previous. There's, there's Joe Morrissey there. Righty ho. And I'll move forward. Because of the organisation, it then became apparent that the Irish gangs had to organise. And between 1900 and 1925, a conflict raged along the New York harbours. It was a war between the Irish gangs and the Italian gangs to control the lucrative rackets that were available on the busy and expanding waterfront warts and warehouses. 
This was the battle between the Sicilian Black Hand Gang and a combination of Irish street gangs who would eventually become known as the White Hand Gang. Now, this vicious conflict would come to a bloody conclusion one Christmas night in 1925 at the Adonis Social Club, an Italian-owned speakeasy in Brooklyn, when a certain Al Capone settled his long-standing feud with the Irish Mafia. Now, the White Hand Gang had numerous le uh, leaders, but the most famous of them was a man who was called Wild Bill Lovett. He was a decorated World War I veteran with a reputation for a fiery temper and a string of murders to his name. This temper gave rise to the nickname Wild Bill Lovett. Now, bizarrely, as with many uh, Irish American mothers, Will Bill's mum wanted him to become a priest. But having grown up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, he joined the young Brady gang, and this taught him how to survive. So it was too late for young Bill to turn his morals around. You know, he joined the uh, American Army during World War I, and given his wild nature, it was no surprise that he became a de decorated soldier. And when he came back, despite being a small, inconspicuous man, he became one of the most vicious killers to head the White Hand Gang. And under his leadership, the mafia, the Italian mafia, was losing its influence. And in fact, one of the rising stars, a certain young Al Capone, was forced to leave New York because the White Hand Gang had put a hit out on him. And he was forced to move to a certain city in Chicago where, hey, the rest is history. But one of the things he tried to do was he consolidated all the Irish American gangs under the White Hand Gang's leadership. And he did this in conjunction with his brother-in-law, who was called Richard Pegleg Lornigan. And despite years and years of infighting, in 1922, peace was finally secured. And Wild Bill and the White Hand Gang became the most predominant gang in New York but the Italians were starting to plot their revenge. One night in November 1923, Lovett arranged to meet up with his old buddies from the war in Brooklyn, and he was very drunk at the end of the night. He was shot in the neck, but he still wouldn't die. He was bludgeoned, and he still wouldn't die. He was finally finished off by an, a mafioso murder expert called Dual Giacchetti the Two Knives and he was finished off by his trade two knives. And that then led to a power vacuum in the White Hand Gang, which was filled by Wild Bill's brother-in-law, Richard Pegleg Lornigan. Now he was an other, another hyper intelligent young man, but he had a very vicious temper and he was also a ruthless killer. He was called Pegleg because when he was eight years old, he nearly lost most of his right leg in an accident when he was only eight years old, he hijacked a railway <laughs> truck uh, in New York. And by the time he, was, he took over the White Hand Gang, he was only 22. But for a twist of fate, he might have avoided crime. Once he was uh, nearly disabled by losing nearly the leg when he was just young, as a young teenager, he actually opened up a bicycle shop with a desire to go straight but he wouldn't pay a tribute to the Italian mafia who controlled the area. And they reported him to the authorities because he was selling uh, stolen bicycles and he was put out of business. And that gave him an almost psychotic hatred of the Italian mafia, which would eventually become his undoing. Now, Pegleg, again, highly intelligent, took over from Wild Bill, and then, then it became the heyday of the White Hand Gang. Remember, they consolidated all the gangs together and they now controlled not only the war front, but they also controlled the gambling and the prostitution. And because of Pegleg's hatred of the Italian Mafia, they were forcing the Italian Mafia out of New York. So something had to be done. Frankie Vale, who was one of Yale, sorry, who was one of the leaders of the Italian Mafia, decided to turn to his old friend, Al Capone. 
and they decided to bring back Al Capone to try and wipe out the White Hand Gang. Now, Al Capone had a perfect cover story. His son, Albert Sonny Capone, was suffering from a bacterial infection, which actually led to an inflammation of his ears. So he took his young son from the hospital in Chicago, and he, himself and his wife May, who was actually of Irish descent, brought their son to see a specialist in New York. And on Christmas night, 1925, at the Adonis Social Club, which was a, a safe house where both the Italian Mafia and the Irish Mafia could actually congregate together, a plan was put into operation that would cut off the head of the entire Irish Mafia. Whilst Capone's wife stayed with her son, Al Capone went to meet his friend Frankie Yale for a drink at the club. Capone and Yale had received a tip-off that Lorna Gim and the entire leadership of the White Hand Gang were planned to visit the Adonis Club as a show of strength, defiance, and also to enjoy a Christmas drink. What happened next was a turning point for both the Irish Mafia and the Italian Mafia. John, Joel, sorry, yeah, just don't forget to advance your slides. Yeah, sorry, I'm getting too excited about the, the talk. I here. know, yeah, because I think we didn't see peg leg there. Right. Previous there. I'll just go previous here, previous here, previous, previous, previous. Now, Peg Leg Lornigan and the Irish Mafia walked him, and in fact, it's the, one of the companions was actually born in my parish, Cornelius Needles Ferry. He was called Needles because he was a heroin addict. Now, they were looking for trouble. Remember, Peg Leg had that almost psychotic hatred of the Italian Mafia. He actually disciplined any of his men who had Italian girlfriends, and he also put a, a levy on the families of any Irish girls who would have Italian boyfriends. And they walked in, they nodded to Al Capone, who was sitting in the corner, and they started to enjoy themselves. However, as the bell struck 12 o'clock, the lights suddenly went out, and gunshots rang across the floor. And when the lights went back on, not only was Peg Leg Lornigan dead, but virtually every one of his key lieutenants was now lying dead. And those that weren't dead were running for the doors and running for their lives. The police turned up, and despite the uh, social club being extremely full and people living above it, nobody heard any shots. Al Capone was arrested. Nobody witnessed anything. Even the two lieutenants of uh, Peg Leg Lornigan that escaped the massacre, when they were investigated, knew nothing about the events whatsoever and denied actually being there. But what happened was fundamental for the future of not only the Irish mob, but also the Italian mob. Because with the death of Peg Leg Lornigan, the head, the intelligence, had been removed from the White Hand Gang, which was the amalgam of all the Irish American gangs in the uh, lower Manhattan. Without that intelligence, without that leadership, there was nobody to take over. What we then began was a series of about six months of infighting, where somebody would take over, they would last for three months, they'd be shot. In fact, the shortest leadership of the White Hand Gang was one individual who lasted 12 hours. That shows you the length of the infighting. As for Al Capone, Capone, he went back to Chicago. As for Frankie Yale and the rest of the Black Hand Gang, the Sicilian Mafia, they now then went about establishing the five family structure and moved in and started to take over all the rackets that the White Hand Gang had been running for the last 10 years. It was the end of the predominance of the Irish American Mafia and the establishment of the rise and the virtual ascendancy of the Italian Mafia. But it wasn't the end for Irish American gangsters, because you have to take into account that there was some men, and one man especially, like only the killer madam, who had the intelligence, the guile, and the brutality to rise to the top. 
you know, only the killer Madden isn't as famous as he should be. And he should be very famous because he was either the enemy, the friend, or the associate of anybody who was anyone in organized crime in New York in the 20s and the 30s. He started out being born in Leeds to uh, Irish parents. His parents were from Mayo. And such was the influx of the Irish into Leeds that the area that Oni was actually born in was called Little Mayo. And this was due to the Industrial Revolution that drew people to the textile mills. Now, the problem was for the Madden family was that Francis Madden, who was Oni's father, was an abusive drunk. And this goes back to a lot of the makeup of the men who make up the Irish wise guys. They were either from a broken home, a single parent home, or no parents whatsoever. And in that brutal upbringing, his wife, Mary Madden, decided to escape Francis Madden in one of his drunken escapades and took Oni and his younger brother and emigrated to, to live with her sister in America. And it's here that the Irish gangster who was born in Leeds was then brought up in Hell's Kitchen. And again, like anybody else, in that such circumstance, he established himself the best way he could. And at 12 years old, he left organised education and joined a gang which was called the Gophers. Again, a very famous gang that had a, a, an evolution from the gangs that John Morrissey had established. You know, they were... At the peak, the Gophers had about 500 members. They even had young apprentice gang members called the Baby Gophers. And when Oni Madden was in charge of the Gophers, one of the Baby Gophers that he mentored was a young man called Vincent Mad Dog Call. And Vincent Mad Dog Call would go on to become one of the most notorious Irish American gangsters in New York. And the key thing about that is despite mentoring, Vincent Mad Dog Call, eventually only the killer Madden became the man that set him up for the hit, but that for later on in our story. By the time only the killer Madden was 18, he had killed five men, hence getting the name. And the reason that he killed the men was that he had an almost paranoid uh, fear of losing any girlfriend that he had. He would sometimes have two or three girlfriends on the go. And despite having two or three girlfriends on the go, if any man spoke to them, he'd beat them up and eventually kill them. Hence why he'd killed five men by the time he was 18. He was intensely jealous of anybody who would show attention to any of his girlfriends. In fact, in 1911, he shot and killed a man called William Henshaw, a shop clerk, whose only crime was he asked out one of Oni's girlfriends. Madden confronted him, shot him in a fit of jealous rage and left him for dead in the street. Now, before Henshaw died, he told the police the man who had shot him. It was only the madam. Madam was arrested, but all charges had to be dropped. As bizarrely, once again, even though the murder was carried out in a busy street, no witnesses saw anything or would come from forward. He was now the undisputed leader of the Gophers, one of the biggest gangs. And they started a war with the other rival gang called the Hudson Dusters, who were led by another Irish gangster called Little Patsy Doyle. And as the body count rose, the intelligence of Oni Madden came to the fore because what he did was he sat down with the leadership of the Dusters, minus Doyle, and told them that Doyle was in fact a police informant. Now, nobody knows for sure if this was actually true, but the key thing that happened was that Doyle lost all the support. His gang broke up. They all joined the Gophers on the condition that Doyle was to be eliminated. And Oni Madam planned his murder in partnership with his Gopher lieutenants. But the problem for Oni was that he was found guilty of the murder and the man who had always dodged any arrest warrants was found guilty and sentenced to 20 years in Sing Sing prison. 
The problem for Oni was that whilst he was in jail, the Gophers disintegrated under his leadership. They evolved into the White Hand Gang. But once the White Hand Gang was wiped out by Al Capone, when Oni finally came out of jail after nine years, he saw that the landscape had changed dramatically. There was no Gophers. There was no White Hand Gang. There was no Irish-American gangs in ascendancy. The landscape was now part of the Italian mafia that was now fed on the riches of prohibition. He now decided that rather than be a linchpin and a kingpin of a gang, he would have to find a mentor. And that mentor was the gangster Dutch Schultz. And Oni, who had been the leader of a gang with 500 members, was now just a lowly foot soldier. But because of his friendship with other gophers who were now lieutenants for Dutch Schultz, he quickly rose through the ranks and became a key associate of Vincent Mad Dog Call and Legs Diamond. But his big break came when he actually met one of the men who, again, is forgotten in Irish-American history, who was one of the most pivotal and important men of the Prohibition, which a guy called Bill Dwyer, who was king of the Rum Runners. You know, Bill was unlike most of the gangsters in the Irish American history. He didn't like violence. He believed that crime should be a business, that prohibition was a business opportunity. And if you adopted business tactics and business techniques, you can make a lot of money. But he was also intelligent enough and wise enough to realize that he needed violence and he needed uh, people whose vi violence was part of their life. And he realized he needed a man like Oni the Killer Madam. When one of his uh, trucks was hijacked, he called not only for vengeance, he called for a meeting. He said, who stole my truck? It turned out that it was Oni the Killer Madam that stole his truck. Oni went into hiding, fearing he would be hit. But Bill, realizing it was business and realizing that Oni had some of the skills i.e. the violence that he could never have, not only set up a meeting, but set up a meeting in a lawyer's office so they could establish a contract to work together, which certainly surprised Oni the Killer Madden, who was so used to uh, violence. Now, the thing that made Bill so rich was the fact that he was what was called a rum runner. What he did was he took in illicit booze from the Caribbean into America. He did this by making sure that he paid off the US Coast Guard, but also by ensuring that he had boats that were faster than any of the Coast Guards that he couldn't bribe. What he did was he bought a whole range of ex-World War I uh, biplanes and took their, put their engines on the back of boats. So no matter if the US Coast Guard were looking after you, if the US Coast Guard were chasing you, they couldn't catch Bill. And such was the amount of alcohol that he flooded into America, he became not only one of the richest uh, gangsters on the East Coast, but one of the richest gangsters in America. But the problem for him was that people were jealous and the Italians and other Irish gangsters were after him. He used that business acumen to identify the key thing that was missing from his DNA was violence. He just didn't like violence. So when he set up that meeting, he sat down with Oni the Killer and said, listen, I've got the business opportunity. I've got the, the, the system set up, but I need somebody who's not afraid to kill and to use violence. And that's when they, they established the relationship between Big Bill Dwyer and Oni the Killer Madder. Now, the thing was, they were making so much money that they had to spend it somehow. And to take that analogy of the Godfather again, one of the things that only the Killer Madden did, uh, backed by Bill Dwyer's money, was they made offers that owners of such clubs like the Cotton Club couldn't refuse. And what they did was it became the venue for gangsters across all different gangs. It became a, a neutral zone. And some of the most famous uh, entertainers of the day would be on the Cotton Club, 
and owning the killer Madden became not only an immensely rich gangster, but a celebrity gangster. You know, such was his celebrity that he had a young man who became his driver. And that driver was a man called George Raft. And anybody who likes the old movies will realise that George Raft was the epitome of the 1930s gangster. And I wonder where he got his style and he got his influence from as he watched his boss control 1930s New York and control the Cotton Club. And that's where George Raft got his ideas from. Another thing that uh, the celebrity gangster did was one of his girlfriends was Mae West. Now, Mae West wasn't a film star at the time. She was... She wasn't a young aspiring actress. She was, because she didn't really become famous until she was in her late 30s. So she was, she was what shall we call her? Let's be polite here. She was uh, a seasoned actress who was trying to achieve fame. Her mother was a cleaner in one of the, the clubs that was run by Oni the Killer, and she introduced them to Oni the Killer. Oni was immediately smitten by her, not only by her beauty, but also by something that he valued, her intelligence. He realised that there was a rare intelligence there, and they soon became an item. And Mae West was trying to put on some shows. She not only was she an actress, she was a writer and a director. She was searching for that fame, for that opportunity. And Madden had the wealth and the connections to fund it. In 1927, Madden financed a stage production written, produced and directed by West called Sex, which had prostitution as one of its central themes. Now, 10 months into its run, it was shut down by the acting mayor of New York, Joseph McKee, whose nickname was Holy Joe. Now, he was standing in for the New York mayor at the time, Jimmy Walker. Now, Jimmy Walker would never have shut down the show because he was in the pay of only the killer. But he had taken a holiday in mob-controlled Havana. And now, Joseph McKee was thinking ahead. He wanted to be mayor himself, and he decided to uh, put his truck in with the decency lobby, who he hoped would fund his run for the mayor and would ensure his election. So he ordered the police to raid the Broadway show, and the prime target was West's sex. Now, the problem was it had been already seen by 325,000 theatre goers, including all the members of the police department, their wives, judges, and seven members of the district attorney's staff. In fact, of all the shows in Broadway, it was one of only two to have a full run. That's not to say it was actually a, a good show. In fact, it was more its content that actually attracted people rather than the quality of the acting. But the delight of the tabloid press, the police raided it. All its actors were hauled off to the police station in Hell's Kitchen, and Mae West spent the night in jail. Now, Madden arranged for West and all the cast to be bailed out and financed the defence at a trial. But West realised that this was her opportunity. This was her opportunity for free publicity and to boost her career. So she refused the bail. She stayed in jail and she demanded to have her day in court. Now, West was found guilty of public indecency and she served a further eight days in prison. But the thing is, Madden paid off all the costs, all the fines, and while West became famous in the future, whenever she needed money, Madden would help her throughout her life. And when West wrote her memoirs, she had a special place in her heart for Only the Killer. She called him sweet, but also oh vicious. So it just shows you how Hollywood can be influenced by crime and not crime influencing Hollywood. Now the thing was, that was the heyday for Oni Madam. Bootlegging, prohibition was there. But as we've seen, the ascendancy was coming 
of the Italian mafia. And the US authorities were going after Big Build Wire. They eventually got him on tax evasion well before they used that tactic to get Al Capone. So it wasn't Al Capone who was first brought down by tax evasion. It was an Irish American gangster, Big Bill Dwyer, that was brought down by the authorities using tax evasion. And when his mentor was put in jail, in fact, the money started to dry up, Madden realized that he had to get out of uh, New York. And he was virtually made an offer that he couldn't refuse. Lucky Luciano had now been setting up the, the structure of the corporation and the five families, but he was a close friend of Madden and said, it's time to go. So what Madden did was he distanced, distanced himself from the New York crime scene and moved to Arkansas. And there in Hot Springs, Arkansas, which was under the the control of a corrupt Irish American mayor called Leo P. McLaughlin. It was now a safe haven for bootlegging, prostitution, and gambling. But Oni now set up a network of hotels. And Lucky Luciano and the Italian mobsters, when they wanted to get out of New York and they wanted to have a holiday with their family, would come to Hot Springs, Arkansas, and they would holiday in the hotels owned by Oni the Killer Madam. In fact, the man who, was, who had set up the gophers, who had been put in jail for murder, who had run the cotton club, who had become a celebrity gangster, now became the hotelier to the mob. And something strange happened to Oni, a man who had that psychotic jealousy of anybody that would talk to his numerous girlfriends. He actually, in his late 40s, fell in love with a spinster postmistress in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and they married, and he remained faithful to her for the rest of his life. But the story of Oni Madden had another twist and turns. He kept a low profile, he controlled the hotels, and he used a whole series of surrogates to run the bootlegging, the prostitution. But the government was starting to look at it. And when the Kennedys came to power and Robert Kennedy became the Attorney General, they started to go after organized crime. And the man they went after first was Oni the Killer Madam. In 1961, a federal investigation concluded that Hot Springs, Arkansas was the site of the largest illegal gambling operation in the United States. And this was no surprise. Oni had been building it up using those surrogates, making sure he wasn't involved as a figurehead ever since he moved there. And Oni Madden was summoned to appear before the US Senate Committee organized, organized crime. And it was led by Robert Kennedy. And no matter the questions that were put towards Oni Madden, he would say, I plead the fifth. I plead the fifth, I plead the fifth. And the Senate Investigation Com Committee had to conclude there was no evidence against only the killing. They could not pin anything on Madden and he avoided all the charges. Only unlike most of the Irish wise guys, survived to die in his own bed. The vast majority, of all his friends, all his associates, would die violent deaths. He'd actually died of emphysema at his home in 1965. This was a peaceful end for Oni the Killer Madam, who ended up entertaining the mob on their holidays. A man who had worked with virtually everybody in the Italian Mafia and the I Irish Mafia, and a man who epitomized the journey of the Irish wise guys, a man who was born in poverty, who'd lived in a broken home, who'd then evolved as an immigrant in the hell's kitchen, who'd left education very, very early, who'd been an instrumental member of the emerging Irish gangs, who'd used his intelligence to rise to the leadership 
of those gangs and who then evolved as the Irish Mafia evolved, as the Italian ascendancy took forward. He attached himself to the wealth of prohibition and used that wealth to become the celebrity gangster whose driver was George Raft and whose girlfriend was Mae West. A hell of a journey for an Irish-American gangster who was born in Leeds. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed that little journey through some of the characters of the Irish Wise Guys. Uh, I would be more than happy to take any questions. And uh, once again, there are more than just Ori the Killer Madden, Mad Dog Call, John Morrissey in the Irish Wise Guys. There's a full stories of Frank the Irishman, Sheeran, Jimmy the Gent, Burke, you know, Henry Hill, wonderful characters like John Cockeye Dull, eh, Dunn, Legs Diamond, and even the tragic story of eh, Vincent Mad Dog Call, the gangster from Gidor. So thank you so much. Thank you, that was fantastic. Um, if you don't mind, you can stop sharing your screen and then we can let people in if they're gonna ask a question. Guys on Zoom, you can uh, unmute yourself if you like. That was brilliant. You know, I'll just get the ball rolling before somebody does ask a question. Um, is it like, am I right in thinking, I suppose the distance, you know, time gives us that kind of maybe that it glamorizes it or, or mutes the violence, but there does seem to be a kind of a difference between those gangs that Morrissey and a few others, you know, started where maybe they were kind of ganging together sort of as protection or to, you know, defend their right to vote, you know, against this nativist movement. And then with the later ones where, you know, they genuinely are actual gangsters who are, you know, armed and dangerous and murdering people. And, and or, or is it that prohibition maybe, you know, narrows the focus into what types of crimes they can do? Because I know, you know, the Dead Rabbits and these gangs down in Five Points weren't innocent, but there does seem to be a sort of a veneer of, oh, sure, God help them, they had no other choice, you know? I think, yeah, there is the veneer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let, let, let's not be up with the bush. Joe Morrissey eventually became a, a US congressman, but he was a brothel keeper. And okay. he was he was a gambler and he was a, a con man uh, in his early days. He would get people drunk and steal their money. And mm -hmm. And the gangs, they controlled that uh, that crime. But that crime was then melded with the uh, politics. Mm -hmm. There was a fantastic uh, member of the the Gophers, was called Battle Axe Annie. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and she was a member of the females, female section. And she could get, ooh, a drop of an hour, she could get 100 people together. And they were used very much in the political spectrum, they were used to break strikes mm -hmm. and to form strikes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they would be involved in breaking and forming the same strike, depending on who would pay the most money. So mm -hmm. that, that, that crime gave them the wealth and the organization. And then that organization was used by the, po the political elements. You know, Tam Tammany Hall, very much geared towards using the gang structure. And then as prohibition comes in, you know, it, it, some amazing Irish American politicians who did a lot for mm -hmm. their constituents, but who were heavily involved with the gangsters. Uh -huh. Jimmy Walker, you know, mm, the glamour it's, there, yeah. It's, it's, it's no, no coincidence that the Mae West Broadway show wasn't shut down when Jimmy Walker was there. Because mm -hmm. Jimmy Walker went to see it. When Jimmy Walker was off in Havana, it's where the the, the, the so-called cleanup brigade would then get involved mm -hmm. and and try to move on them. There's mm -hmm. so to cut a long story short, I, I the, the, there is an evolution. Prohibition made it made it so much wealth, and mm -hmm. because of that, so much wealth they diversified into so many different things. Mm -hmm. You know, if we had the time, you could go into. The reason that Bill Dwyer was brought down by the American authorities wasn't because he basically had bribed virtually every major Coast Guard commander in the eastern, eastern seaboard. It was because 
he used his vast wealth to buy baseball teams, football teams, and ice hockey teams. And mm -hmm. then because he hated to lose, he fixed all the games. And the one thing the authorities couldn't abide was people interfering with sport. Yeah. So that's why they went after him, to bring him down. Hmm. And in fact, only, only Madden dabbled in, in sport, but he was dramatically unsuccessful. Yeah. <laughs> There's huge crossovers between even the politicians. Like, you you know, you mentioned Morrissey and Walker. Big Tim Sullivan, same thing, owned a few brothels and bars himself, died of syphilis. And, you know, did fantastic work after the Triangle Factory fire here in New York for factory conditions. And just as you're talking about the the gaming, you know, the, the fix of the White Sox in, in the early 20th century was yes. you know, done out of a hotel room. So, yeah, yes, we have questions from readers to, or from viewers. Kate says, very interesting. And thank you, John. You had said that many of the members of the Irish gangs could have done something else. Now, I think you mentioned like they were talented enough that they could have getting off the boat and facing immediate prejudice. They need the need for food, taking care of family. Didn't they create or be part of a gang for safety and economically? So I think that kind of coincided, Kate, with what I was asking. And second, weren't the courts and the police also Irish gangs, so to speak? Well, that's an interesting. And certainly the fire department in the early days of New York, you know, were well, kind of gangs. The, yeah. the, the, the fire department were, were basically just organized gangs. Yeah. Because yeah. they didn't yeah. professionalize it until the late 1860s, I think. Yeah. And again, and again if you didn't pay your subscription, let's call it a subscription to the local gang, would the fire department turn up? Mm. And would there be a fire for the fire department to turn up? To? <laughs> yeah, that, wow. that's that's a key thing. I think going back to the first question there, what what I meant with that was that when, when I was researching uh, all the individuals, mm. the, the common things came out, especially when you're looking at the the, the Irish Irish wise guys. There's all all these men here, right? I, f I found that their levels of intelligence and ingenuity was far above what you would call nor normal levels of intelligence. Their skill for organization was phenomenal. Bill, Bill Dwyer, for instance, uh, took organization of prohibition to another level. Everybody talks about Lucky Luciano forming the, uh, the, the, the corporation and the five families. That was modeled on Bill Dwyer's formation of the Combine, where he amalgamated the East and West gangs to ensure the distribution of the illicit prohibition alcohol across America. And because of that distribution of the alcohol, that's where he had to get only, only Madden involved. Because when he was distributing it, what was happening was he was getting hijacked. And Dwyer didn't like violence, you had to get somebody who did like violence and owning the killer was was the ideal candidate. So it just shows you, Lucky Luci in my view, Lucky Luciano copied Bill Dwyer's organisational structure to mm -hmm. eventually form what would become the, the five family structure of the Italian mm -hmm. mafia. Um, Dan asks, he says, great talk with so much history that he wasn't aware of. And he says, was the start of the Irish gang centred in New York? That's very interesting when you look at cities like you know, Boston and Chicago. Oh, yes. Do they have a similar structure or, you know, is it imported from New York or what's going oh, on there? No, definitely. Chicago definitely was, uh, evolved its own own structure. Oh, and mm -hmm. again, there, the, the, the linkage between uh, Al Capone, because Al Capone would eventually, through the war, wipe out the leadership and the structure of the Irish mafia in Chicago. Mm -hmm. but then it's, Again, in Chicago, it showed you the diversity of the Irish uh, mob structure, because unlike the Italian mafia, which was very much restricted by your Sicilian heritage, mm -hmm. in Chicago especially, it was very much a, a, what you would call an Irish, Polish, Jewish triumvirate. You mm -hmm. know, it's uh, Dino Banyan, uh, Jaime Weiss, you know, very much a uh, Polish, Irish, Jewish. There was very, very inclusive, very inclusive. In Boston, there wasn't much of a, a gang structure until really the Summerhill gang 
mm -hmm. was established. Again, Boston, the Italian mafia structure was in ascendancy, but then because a certain man called Whitey Bulger became an FBI informant, mm -hmm. he brought down the Italian mafia and allowed the Summerhill gang, which he then fronted, to mm -hmm. then lead. And again, there's a whole story around Whitey Bulger, how his influence on the the, the troubles in the north. Yeah, and I was going fact, to say that's a different level of gang again, isn't it? You know, when you're but, but, coming listen, to that modern, yeah. And is that there's a little bit of Whitey Bulger, local area. Whitey Bulger, when he was still the FBI's number two wanted man with a two million dollar bounty on his head, used to come fishing to Donegal on holiday, <laughs> and he was he was protected by bodyguards from the IRA because of the money that he was putting into the north. Oh, I'd, I'd believe that. Um, Kate has another interesting question or comment. I have to laugh. She says, I remember when I realised that the Irish went to Holy Spirit Church and the Italians in my neighbourhood went to Mount Carmel. Probably all stems, she asks, from the division of gangs. Should I went to school in Boston, one of the first things I was told was don't set foot in the north. Yes. Wow. Mm. Again, goes back to maybe Pate Lay Lornigan. <laughs> yeah, and like that you would have these... Because, you know, I, I remember talking about this to um, a Jewish colleague when I worked at Fordham University and he was saying, you know, well, they wouldn't have had, you know, the mass would have been in English. I said, sure, all mass was in Latin until yes. Vatican II. Yeah. So it, it wasn't that, the, you know, that the uh, language in the parish structure, you know, like that only Italians could go and hear mass in Italian. No, all mass was in Latin. But it must have been more a breakdown, you know, sort of societally kind of thing that they're not our crowd, you know. I think I think that's the reason. And remember as well, Al Capone did not dislike the Irish. Yeah, he married one. You yeah. know, <laughs> and he joined, and, and, as you said, an Irish gang initially. You know, yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's Al Capone. It was about he lost face when he had to leave New York. He didn't want to leave New York. He was told to by the leadership of the Black Hand Gang. You're too important to us. Off to off to Chicago. Okay. So it was a loss of face there and more honour. And then the massacre of the White Hand Gang, it was business. Mm -hmm. They had to go for the Italians to move into the, the rackets. Yeah. It was, it was business. And then we were talking just before we came on live, um, and we might wrap it up then if nobody else has a question. I thought you kind of made a fascinating comment about, I hate the term, you know, lace curtain Irish but there is this sort of upward mobility of Irish people, particularly in New York. You know, they had started down in the Bowery and the East Side and stuff, moving up to, funnily enough, up to Hell's Kitchen, where a lot of the Irish lived on that kind of West Side. And then, you know, by the 60s, moving out totally to Long Island or the Bronx. So is there an element of, you know, as Irish Catholics became kind of good Americans and kind of middle class solid citizens, that they turned their back on crime, whereas maybe... The Italians or certainly Sicilians didn't have almost as much choice like that, you know, depending on where you came from initially, like you were a member of the gang, you know, or the family. And they were able to successfully keep the women, you know, sort of and, and the family units separate from that. I, I mean, the traditional family. So that Italians were more fed into a gang or a mafia style structure, whereas Italians were able to Irish people, sorry, were able to leave it behind them. I think the I from the research I've done, mm. I think it's because crime was a means to an end, you know, okay. and that was to end the poverty, mm -hmm. you know, and as as they evolved, they, they started to realise this is not the life I want for my children. Mm -hmm. And they move, as, they, as they move out of the areas and other ethnic groups move into those areas, they, there's less of a a need for a gang structure, uh, socioeconomically they've advanced, educationally they've, they've advanced, mm -hmm. and it, it sort of ends that period. The perfect example is that are the Westies, you know, the mm -hmm. Westies that mm -hmm. concentrated in 60s and 70s uh, New York. It was an Irish gang that eventually evolved into a Serbian nationalist gang mm -hmm. as, the, as there was less of a need for that ghetto Irish structure. You know, Mickey Spillane, uh, when he led the, the Westies, he was renowned for going around and making sure that everybody had a turkey at Christmas. 
mm-hmm. he was called the, he was called the gentleman gangster right. you know and he, his was the as their as the Westies controlled the construction in the evolving New York such was their wealth that most of their leadership and their their family moved out of crime yeah and who they're wealth. serving kind of moves yeah yeah and it, yeah. then as narcotics became the backfill for that and as the the intensity of violence increases it becomes less attractive for the Irish mafia or, or those who are involved in Irish background and that's where the the more violent uh, Serbian nationalists move into mm. and and then a, an Irish gang completely evolves out it's an and amazing also, way to look at the changing history of a city, isn't it? Like, you know, yeah. as different groups, because I'm, I'm sure it's the same with, you know, we didn't talk about the Chinese uh, gangs or mafia, you know, but fairly heavy, like down in Chinatown, you know, the Tongs in the early 20th century, of course, in the old stamping ground of Five Points, you know, so it's interesting how well, the communities, you know, move on. Mm-hmm. And rem- remember, as, as, as the, the Irish were as they came into Hell's Kitchen, before them there'd been a German immigrants, and before mm-hmm. them there'd been the freed uh, African-American slaves. So it's a, it's a socioeconomic movement of people, and that, yeah. that does change the dynamic. But the, the way I would see it is that if anybody's interested in the Irish Wise Guys, it's available on Amazon, and I'll pretend you've got the, you'll have copies in your, your book. We will, we'll have shop. copies in the gift shop. Mm-hmm. But, but the key thing is, what I've tried to do is also make it an entertaining read. Yeah. You know, uh, I am not a, a, what I would call a classically trained historian. I'm somebody <laughs> who, I like to discover the stories of forgotten individuals mm-hmm. or, or perhaps people whose stories have been neglected for a while and I've tried to bring them to life as best mm-hmm. I can. Uh, I'm not claiming that there's, there's that much new but I've tried to bring it all together from all the different sources to bring these people to life because these men, and they were violent men, and a lot of them were very evil men, but these men are a part of the evolution of the Irish in America. Absolutely. And also of the of the diaspora that's grown up. And mm-hmm. uh, Now, I hope you're not implying that classically trained historians are boring. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. But... Uh, but uh, I would have I would have to say that perhaps if, if it would I, I wouldn't want it to be looked upon as a as a history. Right, it's it, not a textbook. It's a not it's a textbook. A story. It's, yeah, it's a. What I've tried to do is an entertaining analysis of the lives, the interactions, and yeah. the deaths. Of well, no, you've done huge research in it, and uh, you know your podcast is brilliant too for anyone who wants to follow the podcast. Um, Kate, so she's definitely going to buy it. And Jack here with me just reminded me that Bill Kennedy's book, uh, you know, about Legs Diamond, it kills by one of the cops here in Albany. So, yes. you know, there is that kind of interesting, well, should we say allegedly? I don't know <laughs> if it still is a legend well, or we'll not. Well, see, I, I, yeah. I, love the sto- I love the story about Legs Diamond, Dutch Schultz. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dutch, Dutch Schultz, uh, of Legs Diamond, well, it, obviously some people say he got his nickname because he was a fantastic dancer. Again, he had very exotic girlfriends. Mm-hmm. You know, some of the most beautiful showgirls of the of the time he was involved with them. Uh, so the dancing, but there also his legs is because he, people tried to kill him so many times, he'd run away. Yeah. And after about something like the 17th attempt on his life, <laughs> Dutch Schultz said, "Can I won't swear, but can nobody effing kill this man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's good to end on that Albany connection there. Uh, so, Dutch Schultz. And- was determined to get him and and well he was gotten you know i don't know if dutch yeah. can take the credit but he was gotten um on a on the way out for of, after a liaison with one of his girls i believe so yeah but yeah. listen john joe thank you so much everyone thank you for tuning in both on youtube and here on zoom i'll just give a quick shout out where i'll be burning the midnight oil tonight and tomorrow night finishing the october newsletter but the events are on our website already and facebook so to remind you october 5th at 6 p.m. we have a, another Zoom with Dr. Kieran Riley from Maynooth University. It's the third lecture in our Black 47 commemoration of the 175th anniversary of the Great Hunger. And he's going to talk about evictions. Over 250,000 families were evicted in Ireland, forcibly removed from their homes at that time. And then on the 6th of October at 7 p.m., live and in person in our 
uh, Michael Flanagan Irish Heritage Music Theatre, we have a stage reading of the new musical James Connolly. Uh, it's an amalgam between Connolly himself wrote a song which features in it, but Dennis Foley, A. Cara and John Rodier. Um, so that'll be a stage reading very nice. We have an exhibition, a bilingual English and Gaelic uh, exhibit out there at the moment about Connolly's time in uh, Troy. Mm. And then on the 8th of October, which is a Saturday at 3 p.m., we have Breege Murphy, fantastic singer-songwriter with lifetime membership in Colthus. Um, she's from Armagh and she's coming over to New York. I think we might be her first date. So she'll be here in concert in the theatre as well. So thank you very much and plenty more to look out for in October, but that's enough to fill your calendars for next week. So thank you, John Joe. Thank you everyone for tuning in. I'll let you know when we get the book in store. We won't mention Amazon, but if you're dying for it, it is on Amazon. <laughs> but uh, wait and buy it in your local store. So thank you very much. I just say my second book is also available and I've actually Excellent. put a copy in the the box for you to have a look at. So if you want to oh, supply that to bring it over. We would this, love it, that. Mm -hmm. This is The Irish in Power, which mm -hmm. is about... Uh, oh, I see Mother Jones there. Good. The, yeah. most, the most famous uh, Irish-American politicians. Oh, and excellent. basically, these people were worse than the gangsters. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a lot of overlap. <laughs> a lot of overlap. Yeah. Well, look, you thank know. you so much for staying up. It's 1.15 in the morning for you, so I really appreciate it. You did great. And oh, well. uh, as I say, as we'll, we'll, people enjoy we'll have it. you back on to give a talk about the Irish in power, maybe. That'll be... And the, the good thing is, a little, little known, James Colney and myself were born in the same city. Oh, nice. That's right. Yeah. Edinburgh. Scottish. Yeah, Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Oh, very good. The Cowgate. Yeah. Edinburgh. Oh, see, there you go. <laughs> well, look, thank you very much. And uh, we'll be back next week, as I say. But, and John Joe, we'll have you back on to talk about the Irish in politics. Thank you very much. Great. And okay, have no a problem. Lovely day, everybody.